Chapter 17 The Dupes It was a crestfallen Captain Blood who presided over that hastily summoned council held on the poop deck of the Arabella in the brilliant morning sunshine. It was, he declared afterwards, one of the bitterest moments in his career. He was compelled to digest the fact that having conducted the engagement with a skill of which he might justly be proud, having destroyed a force so superior in ships and guns and men, that Don Miguel de Espinosa had justifiably deemed it overwhelming, his victory was rendered barren by three lucky shots from an unsuspected battery by which they'd been surprised. And barren must their victory remain until they could reduce the fort that still remained to defend the passage. At first, Captain Blood was for putting his ships in order and making the attempt there and then, but the others dissuaded him from betraying an impetuosity usually foreign to him, and born entirely of chagrin, mortification, emotions which will render unreasonable the most reasonable of men. With returning calm, he surveyed the situation. The Arabella was no longer in case to put to sea, the Infanta was merely kept afloat by artifice, and the San Felipe was almost as sorely damaged by the fire she had sustained from the buccaneers before surrendering. Clearly, then, he was compelled to admit in the end that nothing remained but return to Maracaibo, there to refit the ships before attempting to force the passage. And so back to Maracaibo came those defeated victors of that short, terrible fight. And if anything had been wanting further to exasperate their leader, he had it in the pessimism of which Cahusac did not economize expressions. Transported at first to heights of dizzy satisfaction by the swift and easy victory of their inferior force that morning, the Frenchman was now plunged back and more deeply than ever into the abyss of hopelessness, and his mood infested at least the main body of his own followers. It is the end, he told Captain Blood. This time we are checkmated. I'll take the liberty of reminding you that you said the same before. Captain Blood answered him as patiently as he could. Yet you've seen what you've seen. And you'll not deny that in ships and guns we are returning stronger than we went. Look at our present fleet, man. I am looking at it, said Cahuzac. Pish! You're a white-livered cur when all is said. You call me a coward? I'll take that liberty. The Breton glared at him, breathing hard. But he had no mind to ask satisfaction for the insult. He knew too well the kind of satisfaction that Captain Blood was likely to afford him. He remembered the fate of Levasseur so he confined himself to words. It is too much. You got too far, he complained bitterly. Look you, Cahusac. It's sick and tired I am of your perpetual whining and complaining when things are not as smooth as a convent dining table. If you wanted things smooth and easy, you shouldn't have taken to the sea, and you should never have sailed with me. For with me things are never smooth and easy, and that, I think, is all I have to say to you this morning. Cahuzac flung away, cursing, and went to take the feeling of his men. Captain Blood went off to give his surgeon's skill to the wounded, among whom he remained engaged until late afternoon. Then at last he went ashore, his mind made up, and returned to the house of the governor to indict a truculent but very scholarly letter in purest Castilian to Don Miguel. I have shown your excellency this morning of what I am capable, he wrote. Although outnumbered by more than two to one in men and ships and guns, I have sunk or captured the vessels of the great fleet with which you were to come to Maracaibo to destroy us. So that you're no longer in case to carry out your boast, even when your reinforcements on the Santo Nino reach you from La Guiara. From what has occurred, you may judge of what must occur. I should not trouble your excellency with this letter, but that I am a humane man abhorring bloodshed. Therefore, before proceeding to deal with your fort, which you may deem invincible, as I have dealt already with your fleet, which you deemed invincible, I make you purely out of humanitarian considerations. This last offer of terms. I will spare the city of Maracaibo, and forthwith evacuate it, leaving behind me the forty prisoners I have taken in consideration of your paying me the sum of fifty. Fifty thousand pieces of eight, and one hundred head of cattle as a ransom, thereafter granting me unmolested passage of the bar. My prisoners, most of whom are persons of consideration, I will retain as hostages until after my departure, sending them back in the canoes which we shall take with us for that purpose. If your Excellency should be so ill-advised as to refuse these terms and thereby impose upon me the necessity of reducing your fort at the cost of some lives, I warn you that you may expect no quarter from us, and that I shall begin by leaving a heap of ashes where this pleasant city of Maracaibo now stands. The letter written, 
He bade them bring forth from among the prisoners the deputy governor of Maracaibo, who had been taken at Gibraltar. Disclosing its contents to him, he dispatched him with it to Don Miguel. His choice of messenger was shrewd. The deputy governor was of all men the most anxious for the deliverance of his city, the one man who on his own account would plead most fervently for its preservation at all costs from the fate with which Captain Blood was threatening it. And as he reckoned, so it befell. The deputy governor added his own passionate pleading to the proposals of the letter. But Don Miguel was of stouter heart. True, his fleet had been partly destroyed and partly captured, but then, he argued, he had been taken utterly by surprise. That should not happen again. There should be no surprising the fort. Let Captain Blood do his worst at Maracaibo. There should be a bitter reckoning for him when eventually he decided, as sooner or later decide he must, to come forth. The deputy governor was flung into panic. He lost his temper and said some hard things to the admiral but they were not as hard as the thing the admiral said to him in answer. Had you been as loyal to your king in hindering the entrance of these cursed pirates as I shall be in hindering their going forth again, we should not now find ourselves in our present straits. So weary me no more with your coward counsels. I make no terms with Captain Blood. I know my duty to my king, and I intend to perform it. I also know my duty to myself. I have a private score with this rascal. I intend to settle it. Take you that message back. So, back to Maracaibo, back to his own handsome house in which Captain Blood had established his quarters, came the deputy governor with the admiral's answer, and because he'd been shamed into a show of spirit by the admiral's own stout courage in adversity, he delivered it as truculently as the admiral could have desired. And is it like that? said Captain Blood with a quiet smile, though the heart of him sank at this failure of his bluster. Well, well, it's a pity now that the admiral's so headstrong. It was that way he lost his fleet, which was his own to lose. This pleasant city of Maracaibo isn't. So no doubt he'll lose it with fewer misgivings, I'm sorry. Waste, like bloodshed, is a thing abhorrent to me, but there you are. I'll have the faggots to the place in the morning, and maybe when he sees the blaze tomorrow night, he'll begin to believe that Peter Blood is a man of his word. You may go, Don Francisco. The deputy governor went out with dragging feet, followed by guards, his momentary truculence utterly spent. But no sooner had he departed than up leapt Cahusac, who had been of the council assembled to receive the admiral's answer. His face was white, and his hands shook as he held them out in protest. Death of my life, what have you to say now? he cried, his voice husky, and without waiting to hear what it might be, he raved on. I knew you'd not frighten the admiral so easy. He hold us in trap. And he knows it, yet you dream that he will yield himself to your impudent message. Your fool letter, it have sealed the doom of us all. Have you done? quoth Blood quietly as the Frenchman paused for breath. No, I have not. Then spare me the rest. It'll be of the same quality, devil it out. And it doesn't help us to solve the riddle that's before us. But what are you going to do? Is it that you would tell me? It was not a question. It was a demand. Well, how the devil do I know? I was hoping you'd have some ideas yourself, but since you're so desperately concerned to save your skin, you and those that think like you are welcome to leave us, I've no doubt at all. The Spanish Admiral will welcome the abatement of our numbers even at this late date. You shall have the sloop as a parting gift from us, and you can join Don Miguel in the fort for all I care, all for all the good you're likely to be to us in this present pass. It is to my men to decide. Cahusac retorted, swallowing his fury, and on that stalked out to talk to them, leaving the others to deliberate in peace. Next morning early he sought Captain Blood again, found him alone in the patio, pacing to and fro, his head sunk on his breast. Cahusac mistook consideration for dejection. Each of us carries in himself a standard by which to measure his neighbor. We have take you at your word, Captain he announced between sullenness and defiance. Captain Blood paused, shoulders hunched, hands behind his back, and mildly regarded the buccaneer in silence. Cahuzac explained himself. Last night I sent one of my men to the Spanish admiral with a letter I make him offer to capitulate if he will accord us passage with the honors of war. This morning I receive his answer. He accord us this on the understanding that we carry nothing away with us. 
My men, they are embarking them on the sloop. We sail at once. Bon voyage, said Captain Blood, and with a nod he turned on his heel again to resume his interrupted meditation. Is that all you have to say to me? cried Cahusac. There are other things, said Blood over his shoulder, but I know you wouldn't like them. Ha! <laughs> then it's a due, my captain, venomously he added. It is my belief that we shall not meet again. Your belief is my hope, said Captain Blood. Cahuzac flung away, obscenely vituperative. Before noon he was underway with his followers, some sixty dejected men who had allowed themselves to be persuaded by him into that empty-handed departure, in spite of all that Iberville could do to prevent it. The admiral kept faith with him and allowed him free passage out to sea, which from his knowledge of Spaniards was more than Captain Blood had expected. Meanwhile, no sooner had the deserters weighed anchor than Captain Blood received word that the deputy governor begged to be allowed to see him again. Admitted, Don Francisco at once displayed the fact that a night's reflection had quickened his apprehensions for the city of Maracaibo and his condemnation of the admiral's intransigence. Captain Blood received him pleasantly. Good morning to you, Don Francisco. I have postponed the bonfire until nightfall. It will make a better show in the dark. Don Francisco, a slight nervous elderly man of high lineage and low vitality, came straight to business. I am here to tell you, Don Pedro, that if you will hold your hand for three days, I will undertake to raise the ransom you demand, which Don Miguel de Espinosa refuses. Captain Blood confronted him a frown contracting the dark brows above his light eyes. And where will you be raising it? quoth he, faintly betraying his surprise. Don Francisco shook his head. That must remain my affair, he answered. I know where it is to be found, and my compatriots must contribute. Give me leave for three days on parole, and I will see you fully satisfied. Meanwhile, my son remains in your hands as a hostage for my return. And upon that he fell to pleading. But in this he was crisply interrupted. By the saints, you're a bold man, Don Francisco, to come to me with such a tale, to tell me that you know where the ransom's to be raised and yet refuse to say. Do you think now that with a match between your fingers you'd grow more communicative? Don Francisco grew a shade paler, yet again he shook his head. That was the way of Morgan and Lolonay and other pirates. But it is not the way of Captain Blood. If I had doubted that, I should not have disclosed so much. The captain laughed. You old rogue, said he. You play upon my vanity, do you? Upon your honor, Captain. The honor of a pirate? You're surely crazed. The honor of Captain Blood, Don Francisco insisted. You have the repute of making war like a gentleman. Captain Blood laughed again on a bitter, sneering note that made Don Francisco fear the worst. He was not to guess that it was himself the captain mocked. That's merely because it's more remunerative in the end, and that is why you are accorded the three days you ask for. So about it, Don Francisco. You shall have what mules you'll need. I'll see to it. Away went Don Francisco on his errand, leaving Captain Blood to reflect between bitterness and satisfaction that a reputation for as much chivalry as is consistent with piracy is not without its uses. Punctually, on the third day, the deputy governor was back in Maracaibo with his mules laden with plate and money to the value demanded and a herd of a hundred head of cattle driven in by negro slaves. These bullocks were handed over to those of the company who ordinarily were boucan hunters and therefore skilled in the curing of meats, and for the best part of a week thereafter they were busy at the waterside with the quartering and salting of carcasses. While this was doing on the one hand, and the ships were being refitted for sea on the other, Captain Blood was pondering the riddle on the solution of which his own fate depended. Indian spies whom he employed brought him word that the Spaniards, working at low tide, had salved the thirty guns of the Salvador, and this had added yet another battery to their already overwhelming strength. In the end, and hoping for inspiration on the spot, Captain Blood made a reconnaissance in person. At the risk of his life, accompanied by two friendly Indians, he crossed to the island in a canoe under the cover of dark. They concealed themselves and the canoe in the short, thick scrub with which that side of the island was densely covered, and lay there until daybreak. 
Then Blood went forward alone, and with infinite precaution, to make his survey. He went to verify a suspicion that he had formed and approached the fort as nearly as he dared and a deal nearer than was safe. On all fours he crawled to the summit of an eminence a mile or so away, whence he found himself commanding a view of the interior dispositions of the stronghold. By the aid of a telescope, with which he had equipped himself, he was able to verify that, as he had suspected and hoped, the fort's artillery was all mounted on the seaward side. Satisfied, he returned to Maracaibo, and laid before the six who composed his council, Pitt, Hagthorpe, Iberville, Wolverston, Dyke, and Ogle, a proposal to storm the fort from the landward side. Crossing to the island under the cover of night, they would take the Spaniards by surprise and attempt to overpower them before they could shift their guns to meet the onslaught. With the exception of Wolverston, who was by temperament the kind of man who favours desperate chances, those officers received the proposal coldly. Hagthorpe incontinently opposed it. It's a harebrained scheme, Peter, he said gravely, shaking his handsome head. Consider now that we cannot depend upon approaching unperceived to a distance whence we might storm the fort before the cannon could be moved. But even if we could, we can take no cannon ourselves. We must depend entirely upon our small arms. And how shall we, a bare three hundred, for this was the number to which Cahusac's defection had reduced them, cross the open to attack more than twice that number under cover? The others, Dyke, Ogle, Iberville, and even Pitt, whom a loyalty to blood may have made reluctant, loudly approved him. When they had done? I have considered all, said Captain Blood. I have weighed the risks and studied how to lessen them. In these desperate straits, he broke off abruptly. A moment he frowned, deep in thought, then his face was suddenly alight with inspiration. Slowly he drooped his head and sat there considering, weighing chin on his breast. Then he nodded, muttering, Yeah. And again, Yeah. He looked up to face them. Listen, he cried. You may be right. Whether or not, I have thought of a better way. That which should have been the real attack shall be no more than a feint. Here, then, is the plan I now propose. He talked swiftly and clearly, and as he talked, one by one, his officers' faces became alight with eagerness. When he had done, they cried as with one voice that he had saved them. That is yet to be proved in action, said he. Since for the last twenty-four hours all had been in readiness for departure, there was nothing now to delay them, and it was decided to move next morning. Such was Captain Blood's assurance of success that he immediately freed the prisoners held as hostages, and even the negro slaves who were regarded by the others as legitimate plunder. His only precaution against those released prisoners was to order them into the church, and there lock them up to await deliverance at the hands of those who should presently be coming into the city. Then, all being aboard the three ships with the treasure safely stowed in their holds and the slaves under hatches, the buccaneers weighed anchor and stood out for the bar, each vessel towing three paraguas astern. The admiral, beholding their stately advance in the full light of noon, their sails gleaming white in the glare of the sunlight, rubbed his long lean hands in satisfaction and laughed through his teeth. At last, he cried. God delivers him into my hands! He turned to the group of staring officers behind him. Sooner or later it had to be, he said. Say now, gentlemen, whether I am justified of my patience. Here and today the troubles caused to the subjects of the Catholic king by this infamous Don Pedro Sangre, as he once called himself to me. He turned to issue orders, and the fort became lively as a hive. The guns were manned, the gunners already kindling fuses, when the buccaneer fleet, while still heading for Palomas, was observed to bear away to the west. The Spaniards watched them, intrigued. Within a mile and a half to westward of the fort, and within a half mile of the shore, that is to say on the very edge of the shoal water that makes Palomas unapproachable on either side by any but vessels of the shallowest draught, the four ships cast anchor well within the Spaniards' view, but just out of range of their heaviest cannon. Sneeringly, the admiral laughed. Aha! They hesitate to these English dogs. Per Dios! And well they may! They will be waiting for night, suggested his nephew, who stood at his elbow, quivering with excitement. Don Miguel looked at him, smiling. And what shall the night avail them in this narrow passage, under the very muzzles of my guns? Be sure, Esteban, that tonight your father will be paid for. 
He raised his telescope to continue his observation of the buccaneers. He saw that the parawas towed by each vessel were being warped alongside, and he wondered a little what this manoeuvre might portend. A while those parawas were hidden from view behind the hulls. Then, one by one, they reappeared, rowing round and away from the ships, and each boat he observed was crowded with armed men. Thus laden, they were headed for the shore, at a point where it was densely wooded to the water's edge. The eyes of the wandering admiral followed them until the foliage screened them from his view. Then he lowered his telescope and looked at his officers. What the devil does it mean? he asked. None answered him, all being as puzzled as he was himself. After a while, Esteban, who kept his eyes on the water, plucked at his uncle's sleeve. There they go, he cried and pointed. And that indeed went to the Parawas on their way back to the ships. But now it was observed that they were empty, save for the men who rowed them. Their armed cargo had been left ashore. Back to the ships they pulled to return again presently with a fresh load of armed men, which similarly they conveyed to Palomas. And at last one of the Spanish officers ventured an explanation. They are going to attack us by land, to attempt to storm the fort. Of course, the admiral smiled. I had guessed it. Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Shall we make a sally? urged Esteban in his excitement. A sally? Through that scrub? That would be to play into their hands. No, no, we will wait here to receive this attack. Whenever it comes, it is themselves will be destroyed, and utterly. Have no doubt of that. But by evening, the admiral's equanimity was not quite so perfect. By then the Paraguas had made a half-dozen journeys with their loads of men, and they had landed also, as Don Miguel had clearly observed through his telescope, at least a dozen guns. His countenance no longer smiled. It was a little wrathful and a little troubled now as he turned again to his officers. Who was the fool who told me that they numbered but three hundred men in all? They have put at least twice that number ashore already. Amazed as he was, his amazement would have been deeper had he been told the truth, that there was not a single buccaneer or a single gun ashore on Palomas. The deception had been complete. Don Miguel could not guess that the men he had beheld in those piraguas were always the same, that on the journeys to the shore they sat and stood upright in full view, and that on the journeys back to the ships they lay invisible at the bottom of the boats which were thus made to appear empty. The growing fears of the Spanish soldiery at the prospect of a night attack from the landward side by the entire buccaneer force, and a force twice as strong as they had suspected the pestilent blood to command, began to be communicated to the admiral. In the last hours of fading daylight, the Spaniards did precisely what Captain Blood so confidently counted that they would do, precisely what they must do to meet the attack, preparations for which had been so thoroughly simulated. They set themselves to labour like the damned at those ponderous guns in place to command the narrow passage out to sea. Groaning and sweating, urged on by the curses and even the whips of their officers, they toiled in a frenzy of panic-stricken haste to shift the greater number and the more powerful of their guns across to the landward side, there to emplace them anew, so that they might be ready to receive the attack which at any moment now might burst upon them from the woods not half a mile away. Thus, when night fell, although in mortal anxiety of the onslaught of those wild devils whose reckless courage was a byword on the seas of the main, at least the Spaniards were tolerably prepared for it. Waiting, they stood to their guns. And whilst they waited thus under cover of darkness and as the tide began to ebb, Captain Blood's fleet weighed anchor quietly, and, as once before, with no more canvas spread than that which their spirits could carry, so as to give them steering way, and even these having been painted black, the poor vessels, without a light showing, groped their way by soundings to the channel, which led to that narrow passage out to sea. The Elizabeth and the Infanta, leading side by side, were almost abreast of the fort, before their shadowy bulks and the soft gurgle of water at their prows were detected by the Spaniards, whose attention until that moment had been all on the other side. And now there arose on the night air such a sound of human baffled fury as may have resounded about Babel at the confusion of tongues. 
to heighten that confusion and to scatter disorder among the Spanish soldiery, the Elizabeth emptied her larboard guns into the fort as she was swept past on the swift ebb. At once, realizing, though not yet how he had been duped, and that his prey was in the very act of escaping, after all, the Admiral frantically ordered the guns that had been so laboriously moved to be dragged back to their former emplacements, and commanded his gunners meanwhile to the slender batteries that of all his powerful but now unavailable armaments still remained trained upon the channel. With these, after the loss of some precious moments, the fort at last made fire. It was answered by a terrific broadside from the Arabella, which had now drawn abreast and was crowding canvas to her yards. The enraged and gibbering Spaniards had a brief vision of her as the line of flame spurted from her red flank, and the thunder of her broadside drowned the noise of the creaking halyards. After that they saw her no more. Assimilated by the friendly darkness which the lesser Spanish guns were speculatively stabbing, the escaping ships fired never another shot that might assist their baffled and bewildered enemies to locate them. Some slight damage was sustained by Blood's fleet, but by the time the Spaniards had resolved their confusion into some order of dangerous offence, that fleet, well served by a southerly breeze, was through the narrows and standing out to sea. Thus was Don Miguel de Espinosa left to chew the bitter cud of a lost opportunity, and to consider in what terms he would acquaint the supreme council of the Catholic king that Peter Blood had got away from Maracaibo, taking with him two twenty-gun frigates that were lately the property of Spain, to say nothing of two hundred and fifty thousand pieces of eight and other plunder, and all this in spite of Don Miguel's four galleons and his heavily armed fort that at one time had held the pirates so securely trapped. Heavy indeed grew the account of Peter Blood, which Don Miguel swore passionately to heaven should at all costs to himself be paid in full. Nor were the losses already detailed the full total of those suffered on this occasion by the King of Spain. For on the following evening, off the coast of Oruba, at the mouth of the Gulf of Venezuela, Captain Blood's fleet came upon the belated Santo Nino, speeding under full sail to reinforce Don Miguel at Maracaibo. At first the Spaniard had conceived that she was meeting the victorious fleet of Don Miguel returning from the destruction of the pirates, when at comparatively close quarters the pennon of St. George soared to the Arabella's masthead to disillusion her. The Santo Nino chose the better part of valor and struck her flag. Captain Blood ordered her crew to take to the boats and land themselves at Aruba or wherever else they pleased. So considerate was he that to assist them he presented them with several of the piraguas which he still had in tow. You will find, he said to her captain, that Don Miguel is in an extremely bad temper. Command me to him, and say that I venture to remind him that he must blame himself for all the ills that have befallen him. The evil has recoiled upon him, which he loosed when he sent his brother unofficially to make a raid upon the island of Barbados. Bid him think twice before he lets his devils loose upon an English settlement again. With that, he dismissed the captain who went over the side of the Santo Nino, and Captain Blood proceeded to investigate the value of this further prize. When her hatches were removed, a human cargo was disclosed in her hold. Slaves, said Wolverstone, and persisted in that belief, cursing Spanish devilry until Cahusac crawled up out of the dark bowels of the ship and stood blinking in the sunlight. There was more than sunlight to make the Breton pirate blink, and those that crawled out after him, the remnants of his crew, cursed him horribly for the pusillanimity which had brought them into the ignominy of owing their deliverance to those whom they had deserted as lost beyond hope. Their sloop had encountered and had been sunk three days ago by the Santo Nino, and Cahusac had narrowly escaped hanging, merely that for some time he might be a mock among the brethren of the coast. For many a month thereafter, he was to hear in Tortuga the jeering taunt, Where'd you spend the gold that you brought back from Maracaibo? Chapter 12